Welcome to the ID10T Podcast number 1086. Lots of vintage and one-of-a-kind items over at ID10T.com slash vintage. Or you can just go to ID10T.com. Uh, go and look at stuff. We're ironing stuff on shirts now and uh, getting vintage shirts and ironing vintage iron-ons onto vintage shirts. It's been, it's been a lot of fun. So go experience the trip down Pop Culture Lane over at ID10T.com slash vintage. Um, let's talk about you, the ID10T community events at ID10T.com. Like Susan, who writes, I'm writing to tell you about my Etsy store, My Nerd Quilt, which is uh, Etsy.com slash shop slash My Nerd Quilt. Currently, I'm selling masks that feature The Walking Dead, Doctor Who, Star Wars, Harry Potter, Pixar, all sorts of fun graphics, and uh, I'm doing my best to source small amounts of fabrics at a low price so I can continue to make them affordable. Um, about It looks like they're $8.99 for masks, around $8.99. Uh, along with making masks for my store, I've made and donated 200 masks for a friend's local Bay Area uh, LGBTQ homeless charity, Fred Finch Youth and Family Services. You can find my masks on Etsy under my nerd quilt. Fantastic, Susan. Beautiful idea. Wonderful that you're doing them for charity as well. And um, and so we'll head on over there and check it out. Thank you so much for writing in. Events at ID10T.com for anyone else who has a thing they want to share. This episode is Broken Lizards, Kevin Heffernan and Steve Lemmy, who've been on a bunch. Um, and they were on At Midnight. They've I, This must be like the fourth or... Maybe the fourth time they've been on the podcast, but it's such it's great. They just have such great comedy energy, and uh, and I love talking to these fellas. They're promoting Tacoma FD. The second half of season two is happening right now. It just started again uh, Thursday nights at 10 p.m. on True TV. So go check that out. Kevin and Steve, a broken lizard. This is the ID10T podcast number 1086, which we roll... Anon! Initiating ID10T protocol. used to think is steve is steve he's coming on right yeah. now and he's he's I, I really used to think like oh these have to be done in person you just you need to be with someone in the room that's how the energy works hey steve and Hi. uh we started doing these on zoom and now i'm like oh, so i just walk from there to here and then that's it and and we get to talk i've, I've had people on the show that would never have been on because they live in europe or they never come to the West Coast, and so it's been it's been great. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, I guess this pandemic thing. I mean, it's, it's been like promoting and doing all this stuff has been just nonstop Zoom stuff, you know, which is weird, but it works. Yeah, it ha- it, it it's I I feel like it's great from for a lot of things that I never thought. Like I have a I've been working with the same trainer for 15 years and he used to come to my house and we've just been FaceTiming for the last 4 months and it's been fine. Podcasts it's, have been fine, yeah. you know. Yeah. I still That's what I just did. I swear to god this morning Lemmy, we had Lemmy and I worked with the trainer for many years and um I moved and he moved and so we were away from him and uh I just contacted him this morning cuz I'm like way overweight and uh i want to work out with him again he's like yeah i'm doing it i was like let's go then so, it's you know. great i mean all you when you really <laughs> break it down i would never exercise on my own i would just find reasons to not do it but absolutely i've i've had the same guy for 15 years we have a shorthand like i understand like it and so j- even just him like on my phone or ipad just in the corner of the room going making you do it yeah, just tell me what to do. I don't have to think about it. I just kind of surrender like, okay, I'll do, you know, okay, now we're doing this. Now we're doing this yoga thing. Now I'm on the yeah. treadmill. Now we're doing circuit training. Now I'm doing Now I'm vomiting. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm throwing up. Um, but, but wait a second. So like, you know, like uh, when we worked out with our trainer together, I, I thought uh, an art that uh, I certainly honed was the ability to stall. And get out of doing an exercise. 
maybe ask him a question about himself, about his kids. <laughs> yeah. Is yeah. a good thing. How does that work this way? Is it easier? It's got to be easier. It, you know, it's, it's again, I, we've been doing it for so long that it's, it, it, it was very seamless. I mean, it was just very seamless because it, it just, I just need him to tell, to point me in directions of, of what to do. And I, I, I've, I've done the stalling technique too, where you need a second. So you're just like, hey, everything good. How's your dog? Hardwood doesn't cheat, Hardwood doesn't cheat man. <laughs> That's a dog. Dog good? Okay, great. I'm just going to get some water. I got to run blow my nose. You know, like, of course, you know, there are all those stalling techniques. But but honestly, it just being accountable to someone telling you what to do without having to think about it. I think it's so easy to get caught up in the, I don't know what to do. You know, it's like, it's that same thing that keeps you from watching anything on Netflix or that same thing where you just used to go to the video store and just look at box covers and that was your night. Sure. Instead of actually doing something or watching something, it's like the, I can't make a decision. I don't know what to do, you know? So yeah, I, I think it's, uh, are you guys going to train or you probably can't train together because you can't do like a, you'd have to sure. zoom. Yeah. Lemmy's in better shape than I am anyway right now. No, but you know what? But the thing about the trainer, I think you guys were talking about this. I mean, I know you guys were talking about this, but it's like, it would really it benefited me on days where I didn't get enough sleep or maybe I had gone out the night before when I was like, there's no way I'm going to the gym. But instead I have an appointment with somebody who in that case would be coming to my house Yeah. Mm-hmm. or, or I would be going there. And if I didn't go, I was going to lose, you know, a hundred bucks. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. That there's real financial incentive too, even if it's just financial incentive. Cause I know it's not like, I feel like, I mean, we, I, I've been training three days a week for, a long time, years. And, um, I mean, two days a week if I was traveling and doing stand up. but, but, um, I, I just, I know myself now and there are a lot of days where I go, I just don't feel like doing sure. it. And I make my feet take me there. And I just go, if I just get there, it'll be fine. And it's always fine. And some of my best workouts were some of the ones where I did not want to go. And I could have easily talked myself out of it if I was not accountable to someone. Sure. But being accountable to someone like, I, I got to go, you know, it's only in extreme cases if it's like, oh, I'm actually, I got really sick and I can't. But otherwise, yeah. I just, are you pandemic out of shape? Are you getting pandemic? Are you, you know, have you found in this seclusion that you're getting out of shape or? No, I mean, okay. I, I'm, I, I get, I, I'm just, I'm lucky that I've been doing it for so long and I know my body yeah. pretty well. So I, I like, but you know, we just sit around and eat shit while you know while we're. Yeah, I was telling someone that the, the I was telling someone that quarantine is basically like living in a craft service table because you're, <laughs> if you stand it's near true. the craft service table, you're just gonna eat shit, and you know it's like we spend a lot of time in our kitchen hanging out there. The dog likes hanging out in the kitchen. We just huh. we're near food. We have snack foods, you know, and so uh, yeah, it's real easy, but. I don't know. I, I'm, I, I just, yeah, my wife's pissed at me. So yeah. So I, yeah, I, I don't know. It's weird. Uh, I think I, I've always, you know, I've, I've, for the longest time, I don't know how you guys feel about this, but I really did grow up in the, in this story, in the sort of stereotypical and maybe a little prototypical nerd jock dynamic. And so when I was young, I always equated working out with bad because I thought jocks, jocks bad, you know, now, of course, that's not true. Everyone's kind of a little bit of everything. And, you know, yeah. the, the lines have blurred and there's nerdy jocks and there's jockey nerds. And uh, and when I started working out 15 years ago, I started realizing like, oh, this is, I get, I get what this is about. This is a life training as well. I'm learning things about life because I'm learning things about my body and there's a mind-body connection and balance and whatnot. But I still get really embarrassed when I talk about training and fitness because it takes <laughs> me back to this, you know, like, hey, what are you guys doing? You know, and uh, I get the same way though about about eating vegetables, though, Chris. Well, sure. <laughs> when know, we talk about my dieting. life growing up, yeah, my my life growing up, my mom didn't have me eat vegetables, you know. And so now I have the same thing. You know, I need to eat vegetables. I should eat vegetables, and I think it's dorky, and I don't do it. It's bullshit. Isn't it funny how many things we don't do just because we think they're <laughs> dorky? Like that's not even <laughs> life threatening. Ah, this is dorky. Sure. So what? Sure. This is the whole mask thing too. It's like people think it's dorky and they don't want to do it. And you know, people get sick, you know. Yeah, I thought I mean, you were say, get, you getting know. coronavirus is a pretty dorky thing to do too. Maybe it we is. need to start well, 
You know, that's get not over it. You, need to you gotta get over it, man. Yeah. Have, have some confidence. Kevin, yourself. I could Don't say the same dorky. thing. I could say the same thing about uh, dancing. You know, you think dancing is dorky, and I think you need to get over it. I do. I'm not. So, I, I these are my hangups. I get it, man. I need to eat vegetables, and I need to dance more. That's you know, I get it. Is there a Lemmy Heffernan like uh, dance party Zoom d- dance party that happens on? Uh, on <laughs> That's a great idea. Once a month. That is a good idea. No, we in, in one of these episodes for the new show for the show this season, I dance salsa, and uh, I I'm not a dancer. I've never danced salsa, and we got like a professional salsa dancer, like you know, a so you think you can dance person to come in and dance with me and teach me how to dance. And Lemmy just loved it. He loved every second of making me have to dance. So. Let me tell you, let me give you the, let me give you the behind the scenes. I directed this episode <laughs> and, uh, you know, Heffernan historically has never prepared, uh, for his, his roles and, uh, particularly like, not method in club <laughs> dread. Like he had to be a sword expert and he had to be a professional masseuse. And, you know, I said, are you going to do some like sword work or something? He's like, no, nah, I'll do it on the day. I'll get it. And he does like the comedy version of it, you know, where he's like, it's you know, about his attitude, but like the movements suck, you know, like the swords aren't parallel. Like he can't hold them properly. And it's just it's a bunch of bullshit. That, that, thinks, that's no. where improv training can really bite you in the, I think improv training is great for everything except it can foster that idea of like, I'll just figure it out. Cause I, I yeah. know, you know, but yeah. when, well, well, he thinks he thinks preparation is dorky. He thinks that the preparation <laughs> for the role is dorky. And I'm telling uh, you, I'm, I'm getting over that stuff, man. I'm getting over my hangups. Well, so so then uh, we had this big salsa dance scene. It's a cold open of, in week ten, and uh, I said, "You you have to practice." And he's like, "Nah, it's dorky. Don't worry, I'll get it on the day. I'll get it." <laughs> and I was like, "This this is real. We want to do a thing." Like, I, and as the director, I had like some you know, a few salsa videos I wanted to emulate. And then, you know, and I insisted on a rehearsal. And so he came reluctantly, and, you know, his daughters came and uh, I'm glad they did. Cause you know, they, they took some fantastic videos. Mm-hmm. And then we had this beautiful, incredible salsa dancer who's one of the top salsa dancers in the world with the choreographer of, you know, of dancing with the stars and like Celine Dion's residency in Las Vegas, he was there. <laughs> and and Kevin did the dance, and I think at that moment he realized that he had better prepare. Sure. So it, I was like the Grinch; my heart grew twenty sizes that day. And uh, that's right. I learned my lesson. You learn. You yeah. learned. You learned that it's not dorky to prepare sometimes. No. Yeah. And, and he cool. got it on the first cool. take. He but got you know, it on the first take. About, what's interesting about that is that it's, you know, on the one hand. There, there is that sort of balance between like, well, you want things to be spontaneous and funny and it can be difficult. Comedy can be difficult when things are too meticulously planned because you just never know what the energy is going to be on the day. But then, then there is also like, for me, I also sometimes feel the laziness of like, ah, I don't feel like doing that right now. I'll just do it, you know? <laughs> so it's like those, those two forces, am I being lazy or am I, or am I being like, yeah. or am I being a good comedy person? I, I don't know. I don't know. Sure. But then when you, when you like, if, Kevin had actually taken the time to become a master salsa dancer. That would have <laughs> unlocked a whole new, uh, a whole new um, amount, amount, Jesus. And I'm speaking like Sylvester Stallone. Now. He, uh, th- that would have just unlocked a lot of new dance moves and, and a lot of possibilities. Is well, like I become like the, the best comedy salsa dancer around or something? Yeah. The best yeah, big actually. guy salsa dancer? Yes. Or, to, yes or, or True TV spins off Tacoma Salsa, where your character yeah. opens a salsa studio. Sure. And Irish guy yeah. with a salsa, Irish fat guy with a salsa studio. And yes. might get a visit sure. from a couple of familiar faces from the Tacoma FG. <laughs> 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 this is all making me think talking about dance party makes me think maybe we should maybe we should all resurrect the grind from the 90s but it's like a middle age grind uh, <laughs> we'll just we'll just call it the rust and it's just like a bunch of people a bunch of middle aged people will just cut to them sort of like half dancing or really trying to make it work having to take time sure. outs I think sure. I think yeah. there's something really fun there <laughs> yeah, the sad thing is, is that you know our intentions would be would be good, and uh, and no one would tune in because uh, you know nobody wants to watch old people dance. <laughs> <laughs> I think they would watch it in one YouTube video. Like, there's one yeah. one TikTok or one YouTube video. I don't know if they'd watch it as a series. <laughs> I remember, I remember when I was a kid, and the Love Boat was uh, was popular. Now I'm aging myself, but like when I was a little kid, I'd watch the Love Boat. 
And I always noticed that like the young couples who hooked up would kiss with their tongues. They would French kiss. And when they would have like the older couples who were looking for love and they kissed, it was always still like just a little peck on the Lido deck. And then they'd call it a day with that. Uh... <laughs> but then graphic sex scene from the old couples. That's the part they didn't. <laughs> it's just a light kiss. It was sure. a different time. Below the lens. It was a day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, they should have they should have shown the old people going at it with their expertise, like just positions <laughs> and tricks that they've learned over the years in different countries. While, yeah. while they play the... <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah, it wouldn't I, be the love boat then, right? Be the... I mean, the love boat, by the way, I mean, you're not... Yes, you're, you're dating me as well. I mean, of course I watched the love boat. And and I don't necessarily even remember why, but it was just such a brilliant concept of it's just, you have your core cast and then it's just sort of populated by guest stars every week, these vignettes, and the stakes are very low and yeah. then everything's fine. I think it was Love Boat and Fantasy Island where the was like the power back back. it's like Saturday yeah. night or whatever. Love Boat and Fantasy Island and uh Yeah, yeah Fantasy yeah. Island's a little darker. A little darker sometimes. Fantasy Island was a know, little darker. The love boat was, you know, fluffy. It was fluffy. It was great. Yeah. Well, Fantasy Island. If you Island. go back, like, you can go down a rabbit hole. Like, they have clips of Love Boat, you know, on YouTube or stuff. You can go down a rabbit hole and just see how it plays. I, I, I've done that recently. Watched a few clips from the Love Boat. It's a different, it's a different world. It's a well, different era. First of all, single camera laugh track. Yeah. It, it, it's, I get it. I mean, I get, you know, you're coming like out. Outdoors. Of like, <laughs> yeah. Outdoors. It's sort of outdoors. <laughs> you're you you know you're coming out of a time where it's like the three the three camera sitcom is you know king and so they're trying to figure out like oh how do we shoot this different but we need to let i mean like the love boat without a laugh track is we i mean with a laugh track is weird i'll bet it would be really bizarre if you dropped out the laugh track sure it'd be embarrassing <laughs> 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 well, because we're getting back into a time where they might have to add laugh tracks into things because we can't have audiences for stuff at the moment. So yeah, I mean, that's what they're doing in the baseball games. They're just pumping crowd noise and, and booze into baseball games right now. That's what they're doing. You know? I, I really enjoyed it. There was a, in the Yankees uh, Nationals game this past weekend, there was a really close call at first place, or at first base that went the way of the Yankees, who were the yeah. away team. And they actually pumped in like a dubious <laughs> crowd noise, like, whoa, you know, like that. Yeah, kind of completely thing. fake. I loved it. I loved it. Mm -hmm. I loved it. The crowd noise I, I thought was great because I was just focused on the <laughs> on the baseball players and then I could hear the noise. It sounded familiar. There's some organ going, you know. They should pump oh. that crowd noise into the love boat, right? Cheers and booze and stuff. That'd be great. <laughs> Boo. <laughs> Boo. Every time Gopher, like, fucks something up. Boo. <laughs> yeah. Boo. yeah. <laughs> and Doc. And now we pause the ID10T chatter to thank the sponsor for this episode of the podcast, Squarespace domains, websites, online stores, marketing tools, and now, very important, email campaigns, because it's very helpful to tell people about your domains, websites, online stores, or marketing tools. Um, so Squarespace is so easy to use, all right? You just whatever idea you have, you can turn it into a website, uh, and you have powerful editing tools. You can really make it your own and customize it. The layouts are just about any message that you could possibly have. Mobile editing, you can send it anytime, anywhere. And like I said, you have this consistent content from website to email with the email campaigns is everything you need is optimized right out of the box, especially for mobile. You can buy domains, choose from over 200 extensions, and then you can actually track your analytics so you can grow all that in real time. All right, free and secure hosting, uh, nothing to patch or upgrade ever, and 24-7 award-winning customer support. Okay, so please go to squarespace.com slash ID10T Get a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, use the offer code ID10T to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thank you to Squarespace for continuing to sponsor the ID10T podcast, which now we glide back into. That sort of reminds me of there was this old, there was this, uh, it was called from years and years ago on uh, on the old internet, I think it was called... I don't want to fuck this up, but I think it was called Garfield minus Garfield. And someone basically just would like show the Garfield comics, but removed Garfield from the comics. And John Arbuckle <laughs> just looked insane. Uh, it just looked like a guy unraveling. 
I, yeah. I, I remember that. Yes. Oh, you do yeah. remember that. Talking, okay, to, him, talking to himself. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah exactly. Imaginary, imaginary friend or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> do, you, do you guys do? You, do you do you ever envision yourselves doing like a traditional three four camera sitcom, or do you think do you just do you really like shooting single? I like shooting. Single. I, I you know like every once in a while you'll guest star on one you know like a multi cam. It just feels kind of strange to me. I, I don't know. It feels like it's a different. It's a different rhythm, you know, and and you and you walk in and you do those shows and you have to speak differently and the jokes come out differently. They just don't come out right for me. Because that's, that's what like it is, theater, it's basically. Like, yeah, it's like a, it's but like, like a but, but, it, but like but different, you know, because like like you know you audition for them, and it's like I can't even wrap my head around this cadence. It's like set up, set up, punchline, set up, set up, punchline. Whereas right. like you know, like Tacoma FD, for instance, is a funny conversation. But it's not set up, set up punchline, and and it's also real conversation, and also we can improvise. And so, like the sitcom thing, though, is just you know, I I, I think it's hard, and I and I respect people and I admire people who can do it, you know, because it's it's a talent, and uh, and it's there's a certain, a certain muscle that you you well, develop, it's joke based you know, versus right? character based, and at a certain point, if yeah. a sitcom's been on long enough, then the jokes can become character based, but really, kind of initially, it really is just. It's just yeah, bum, 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 bum. yeah, yeah, yeah. As yeah, opposed yeah, to, yeah. I mean, you guys are essentially shooting a film, and you're just cutting the, you're cutting it into a comedy form, right, right, yeah. So yeah, I, mean, I, you our, know, I would say our, our rough cuts are, you know, for a 24 minute episode, are you know, a lot of them are coming at like 38, 39 minutes. We're like, shit, we have to cut, you know, one third of this out. But the end result is that then you're just stringing the best jokes together, and it's, you know, it's it's easier than I think. Uh, doing the 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 you know the multi cam uh, rhythm. Do you like doing a show versus doing a film? I do. I mean, I definitely do. Like, well, we it was weird because you know it takes for us. It would always take like a couple of years between movies, you know. And uh, I feel like when we do TV show, we figured out you're doing the same content as three movies, you know, in that same period of time, and it takes us whatever, you know nine years to do three movies you know so it's like i i feel like we get so many more jokes and so much more content so many more storylines that we can just tell that it's kind of more fun to throw more shit at the wall basically you know yeah yeah i mean you know we wrote super troopers one probably over the course of like four or five years and just a draft after draft after draft it's and it's so still hard like, to get made yeah yeah and it's still like there's there's the main plot and then there's a couple of subplots and we're putting in jokes but like you know, we, we do 13 episodes, we did 13 episodes this past season, and it's like, literally everything that we ever riffed about, we were like, that'd be a good episode, that'd be a good episode, hey, there's a good B-plot, hey, that's a funny thing, and then it's like, you know, each day you break a new episode, and then, you know, you just start writing these scripts, and it's like, and then when you're shooting, as an actor, you're doing a new story each week. Yeah. And it's like, oh, that, this is what we're it's doing. It's much less precious. You know, the movies are so precious. Like every line and every joke, it's only, you only get this much time, the TV stuff. That's a great point. Precious. I always wonder yeah. about that. Like, because I don't, and I don't know what the, I don't know if there is a right answer. Like sometimes pouring over stuff, like you really can get the best thing. But then other times the spontaneity of a moment and not overthinking things. I mean, I think as you get older, it's just easier to, you're, it's less energy to not overthink things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I can understand. And also like, you know, I imagine it's like when a band, you know, puts out their first album and it's like, oh my God, it, it this changed music. But it, it's like the sum total of 10 years of work. Yeah. And then they're like, okay, do that again. But now you only have like 10 months or a year. They're like, oh, right. boy, we already, boy, we, we already kind of blew up. Like, so how, how do you... It's also the dynamic, though. It's the relationships. Like, that, to me, that's even more so. Because the material will get there. The material will make good. But, like, the the need to create that joke in that precious moment creates tensions between people in the band. It creates right. tensions between people in the thing where it's like, I got to get my joke in. No, I got to get my joke in. This has to be my moment. I need enough moments. You know what I mean? But the TV stuff, there's enough for everybody. I feel like the 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 movie stuff, you can knock heads a lot more. I feel like. Oh, I well, thought think, about that. Yeah. yeah. And I think early on, you know, we didn't have the foresight or the money when we made those movies to say we're going to shoot it a few different ways. We would say, no, this is it. it this is it, and we're going to do it this way. We didn't. We didn't have the budget to improvise. We were going like, 
on our first three movies, like a couple of takes only for each thing. And with TV, you know, like Kevin now, Kevin and I now, we're working together so closely on this thing. We're just not going to, we'll have disagreements, but we're not going to argue about anything. And if we can see something that is heading towards an argument, we'll just, we'll just choose, you know, and it's like, and you figure out which hill you're going to, which battle you're really going to fight. And, uh, you know, and then when we shoot, it's like, we're like, all right, let's do it. Let's do it multiple ways and just right. see which one is the funniest. Cause that's really how you can figure it out is like when you're in the editing room and you're looking at it, okay, now we see what it looks like and we're in a context, not just, you know, in the scene. And also there's a bunch of editors here and one of them will come in and be like, Oh man, I loved that. Uh, the apple on the shoulder joke, dude, that thing was crazy. <laughs> and you're like, okay, well that's, you know, and that's how you, you can judge it, but it's not, and as you get older, these things aren't worth fighting about. It's just, no, a it's joke. just because jokes are like, Jokes are jokes. And then, and I find like jokes that I would, in, in the history of my life, if I ever really dug my heels in on a joke afterwards, I was like, nah, I don't know. Maybe it really wasn't, you know, like I like collaborating with people because I, I tend to trust other people. Like if someone else has an opinion on something and they have a strong opinion about it, I just feel like, oh, okay, well, you know, if you feel strongly about that, then that probably is the right, I don't know, you know. Yeah. Uh, that that's kind of what I miss from being a stand up. I mean, that what, doing stand up, what I miss is like it's not a collaborative effort, you know. Unless you're like sitting down to write with someone and you're bouncing jokes off each other. But I love the collaboration process because you have. I know it can turn sideways if you guys disagree, but if you're willing yeah. to kind of let the egos go, sometimes then it's great. You have a whole new chemistry with a, a, a person or people to create something different. Yeah, yeah. When you're but younger you, though, it's it's harder. Younger, you're you're fighting way more. You know what I mean? Younger, you don't appreciate that as much. You know, so it's like you're knocking heads, and you know it, it makes it less pleasant. I think as we get older, we like, we realize when to fight and when not to fight. Yeah, yeah, and I think also doing stand up has has been helpful for us too. You know, we we did stand up on the road together for probably like nine or ten years, and and like as a solo stand up or even two guys going out there together you do come to the really like very quickly you come to the realization that like the joke that you thought was hysterical and is going to kill you go out there and it bombs and you're like well that's the way it works <laughs> sometimes i think something's hysterical and it sucks i'm the only one who thinks it's funny and sometimes there's something that i'm just tossing off and the crowd goes nuts for it and you build a whole set around that thing because you're I like i didn't realize that. yeah 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 I, I totally interrupted you steve i'm sorry if you want to no, no, go i was done i was done i was done the problem is I I'm I, I had a a coffee and now I'm drinking a decaf coffee but I'm like really <laughs> caffeinated. It's more ca it's more caffeine than I can actually handle even one espresso shot. So I'm just always right on top. Like oh here's another thing. So I apologize. But um, please don't, Chris. Please don't. It makes you a good host. <laughs> no, I have a theory about why. At least for me, why can I interrupt you? Can I interrupt you, Chris? Please. <laughs> yeah. Um, don't interrupt who, me. Here's the thing. No, here's the thing. A, a good what a good host does is they interrupt you and they apologize for interrupting. And then when they're done with their story, they bring you back to what you were saying. They say, "I'm sorry for interrupting, Chris. You were about to continue with your interruption. Go." <laughs> That's right. You have to put a you have to put a mental placeholder in. My brain, like doing podcasts, and I I didn't even I don't even think of it, you know, this concretely. But it is sort of like I see it sort of like the conversation is a waveform. And if I make an edit right here to create a <laughs> marker and I yeah. add another track and I start that little bit of thing and then I go back to the previous marker, I, re I really do see them as waveforms <laughs> in my head. Absolutely. That's right. Absolutely. That's right. Um, but anyway, you were saying, you were saying about uh, bombing. So bringing it back to what you were saying before. Uh, <laughs> Very um, well done. But the, so I, at least for me, I don't know if this is true for everyone. Cause ever, I think everyone kind of has an, a, a different internal audience or different internal critic or whatever. But for me, I have found that jokes that I think are like really hilarious, rarely connect with the audience. And like you said, uh, Steve, the ones that you just are sort of like not really thinking about kill and you go, oh, wow. I love that discovery process because it shows that you're creating a relationship with the audience. But my theory on why those jokes don't work is because they're too inside your own head. It's like if you and Kevin, um, you know, like come up with a joke and it fucking destroys and you have this inside joke with each other and you try to tell someone else the inside joke, they weren't a part of it. And so I think the jokes that make us 
like die laughing inside uh, are too inside our own head. Like, because they're just too dependent on the very specific relationship that our brain has with itself. And yeah. so that's why I think, I mean, I have jokes that really are heartbreaking that I've like, God, I thought this was so funny and have tried again and again and again. And they just don't, they just don't work. And, uh, and I just kind of go, okay, well, I guess, I guess that one was just for me. Right. Yeah. Uh, well, so, that, but, but so then, so then in collaboration, you know, and that's a relationship you have with yourself on stage and you have no one to blame but yourself and you have that fight with yourself. In collaboration, we discovered in, during the movies, you know, you get precious about it and then you fight for something like even in the editing room and then you have the test screening. And I remember there were times where like, there were, there were jokes and I remember like, Kev, you know, Kevin and Jay did most of the editing of the movies or all the editing of the movies and we would come in and, and, and watch and, and give our criticisms and critiques and they would have disagreements about things. And in the test screening, you know, the thing would get a laugh and whoever was cor correct would look down the aisle <laughs> lean forward. at the other guy and, <laughs> and lean back. And, and uh, I think the pain of being the loser in that scenario is something that can make you grow up a little bit, you know, and, but also the intelligence, you know, so Kevin and I know we're like, it can go either way. You know, we're not so stupid as to think that like my way is the only way. And we've had those fights. Mm -hmm. I know I'm fun. I know my way is funnier. And so we just do it both ways. And it's much easier that way. The funny know? thing, though, let me, the funny thing, though, is when you all think it's going to be great. Those are good community builders where you're like, you know Absolutely. what? You know, because you, you go through an experience together and, and that's how you learn. And I don't, you know, I also just want to sort of add the correction, the, the modification that, it's okay to like to think something's funny and go, oh yeah, I think this is a funny idea to try. That's where the instinct comes from. And I think that's what you can listen to. Like, oh yeah, I think this is kind of funny. But it's when in your head you think it's like over the top hilarious. This is gonna kill. It's mm -hmm. like, no, no, no. It's, it's just the audience in your head. You're too close to it. And that's why you thought it was so hilarious. But mm -hmm. you know, if well, you just think something's funny, oh, this is a funny idea, I'll try this, then, then that works. No, but it is, it's like, I think it's, it might be the first thing you learn in stand up is never to expect that your jokes are going to kill because like, I know the first time I ever tried stand up, I went out there on stage thinking I was about to slay the place mm -hmm. and the first joke sucked and I wasn't prepared for that. And cause that didn't even enter my mind and I could feel the color draining from my face and I could feel my legs getting weak. And I was like, I got 15 minutes to go here. Yeah, you know, and it was like, and each joke got worse and worse, and the confidence, you know, got less and less, and the audience was feeding on that, and it was terrible. But I came off the stage, and I was like, that was the best experience of my life. Like I, I did it, and that was just as powerful. And also, I learned a valuable lesson. That's how you learn the craft. I think of stand up is how to is one of the one of the main craft crafty things about stand up is how to be in that situation not have it rattle you and pull out of the situation and the art of stand up is how you do that. Like how masterfully yeah. can you, can you do that? But it's just one of those weird, it's just one of those things that you just, it's like flight hours. You just, you just need to do it a lot before you can't, you can't, I couldn't, you couldn't tell someone that you couldn't say to someone, here's what you need to do to prepare for this emote. You just have to go through it a lot <laughs> and then, and then it intuitively makes sense, but it's the sum total of, you know, a lot of times on stage. Yeah, we, it covers you up, man. <laughs> <laughs> but also just like when, when you kind of go through, you know, like for a lot of people, you know, like a, a really bad thing that can happen to them is they're on stage talking and everyone is folded their arms and rejecting yeah. them. And then once you survive that a handful of times, you're like, oh, okay, well, I'm still breathing. And I, you know, yeah, I can do this. Out. It's yeah. a, you have to walk through that fire in order to know that you can do that and be comfortable with it. And that's what, that's the sucky part is that you can't just succeed all the time. It is a, it is a skill set that is built on failure, basically. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But the failures yeah. are learning experience. And the failures are the best stories, too. I and mean, those are the best stories. They are. I In did a... respect, they are. <laughs> <laughs> they really are. <laughs> it, it's true. I, when you're up there, they suck. I did a, a, a casino show with Dove Davidoff. And, uh, it, like, in, here in California, and it was a big ballroom. And we had an opener, and it was his first time doing stand-up comedy. 
and the, and the ballroom was not full at all. It was like probably twenty percent full. Yeah. And and the kid was like, "Do you guys have any advice for me before I go out there?" And Dove was like, uh, "It's gonna suck." <laughs> and uh, and and the kid was like, "Really?" And 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 Dove was like, "What do you think, Steve?" I was like, "Yeah, go out there. You're gonna do terribly, and just know that, <laughs> and don't worry about it when nobody laughs." And he was like, I, the kid was like, I don't know. I have a pretty good set here. We're like, all right, go with God, go for it. <laughs> and he went out there and fucking bombed. And it was all the things we talked about, like no laughs, sparse room, high ceilings. Oh yeah, all the bad dynamics of a, of a <laughs> all the bad crowd dynamics. A ballroom. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, in, in a casino where people yeah. like come in because they've are, are trying not to continue to lose money. Right, they're taking a break. <laughs> they're taking a break. They're probably or whatever. The, over. Our worst casino thing was Foxwoods, Lemmy. We uh, we were oh, doing gosh. a show at that. They had that club out there, Comics. I don't know if it's still there or not, but and it was next to the theater at Foxwoods. And so uh, Loretta Lynn was in the theater doing oh, wow. a concert, and she got sick, so they canceled her show. And so uh, they comped her entire audience to our comedy show, and so uh, <laughs> all these people came in in wheelchairs and auction tanks and whatever and they came to our the super troopers guys stand-up comedy show and it was a nightmare it was you know well, it was a bunch of octogenarians coal miner's daughter uh, <laughs> <I know. laughs> they wouldn't and we're doing <laughs> we're doing jokes about jacking off and kids <laughs> you know like, <laughs> and, they, and, and you can hear them loretta linzak though where she was like before i do coal miner's daughter you yeah. know just rubbing one out and you're just on it like a wash tub. <laughs> I thought I thought you I was gonna make the joke when you said Loretta Lynn canceled. I was like, oh so they had you guys fill in and that actually was kind of what happened. Yeah, yeah. we did. But they brought in us. Their audience came to us. <laughs> and they were pissed about the two drink minimum. I tell you that much. That crowd was pissed about the two. Oh you could hear them arguing about it. I am not gonna pay two drinks. Why should I have to pay two you're like you're in the middle of your <laughs> masturbation set. But that's, but you know, I, like just hearing you talk about the ballroom show and that show, when you know that a show is going to be challenging or might suck and you, you sort of become mindful of that, maybe that's the mindfulness of comedy is that it actually can become really fun because you know it's going to be this weird stuff oh, yeah. and it's going to be unique experience. And gallows humor. <laughs> and you can also have fun with it, but also it, it's like, we have to remember that a successful show does not necessarily have to be one where the room is packed and everyone's falling out of their chairs laughing. Like sometimes it can be enough that you did the best you could in a challenging situation and you got through it. So you were yeah. successful for that show. No one could have killed in this situation, you know? <laughs> what was that place, Kevin, that we played down in Marco Island? Captain, uh... Oh, Captain uh, Ron? No, not Captain Ron. That's a movie. Do you ever play? Do you ever play that, Chris? No. It was, like a, it was called Off the Hook. Was the comedy club? It was in Florida, down in Marco Island, funny. Florida. Fishing thing. And um, it was in a. Um, it was it doubled as a seafood restaurant. So it was a. <laughs> it was a seafood restaurant and a, and a stand club, and it was very popular. A lot of people would go down because it's such a beautiful location. So you'd go and you'd see a list people in this in this restaurant, and um, and we went down there. It was just a nightmare. People were cracking lobsters while you're doing your. Oh, I'm sure. I don't know for real. Like, you'd you'd be doing your set in the front row. There's somebody like with the they're struggling with the claw and they've got the cracker and then the the claw shoots onto the stage. And you're like, oh, oh yeah, that yeah. for you. You put it back. And the kitchen was open and about twenty feet from the stage. And so the guys are in the kitchen just screaming shit at each other. And the and the plates are clanking and and uh, the wife the the guy the owner's wife. We bombed pretty hard there, and the the, yeah. the owner's wife, the the wall of comedians that had come through there was the wife with the comedian and like a thousand photos of the mm -hmm. wife and the comedians and all a listers, you know, it's just all a listers, it's you know, yeah. And sh she brought some friends to the show, but uh, and we met her afterwards, and we were waiting to take a picture with her, and she never asked. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, so then 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 that that gets you on two insecurity fronts. Did I not have? Yeah. Oh, and am I not famous enough? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. That was a terrible one. I haven't, terrible I haven't one. done well. It's been a long time since I did those kinds of shows where they kind of sandwich comedy into uh, into a weird venue because you know yeah. not everyone understands the comedy does need a certain setup. 
you know, I mean, the the master at like how a stand up room should work is Todd Glass. Todd, it's Todd Glass, yeah. Todd was very particular. Yeah. You just need <laughs> just a little detail. Just put a fucking candle on the yeah. table. He gets yeah. so upset about it. Fine, you want to put a candle on the table? Fuck you. I hope you fail. You know, he wanted he wanted to put the exit lights uh, out. You know, over the doors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know ambience, what? You hear you him know? out, and you're like, "Fuck, he's great." You know, like, yeah. Right. But, but he's like, "I'm going to do my own introduction announcement. I'll give it to you. I don't want you to do my announcement. I'm going to do my announcement. I'm going right. to give it to you." Yeah. But do you remember Kev? Kev, that we. Did oh yes, that, yes. Todd's podcast, and he was like, uh, "Have you guys ever been down to this place in Marco Island? It's called Off the Hook." And we're <laughs> like, "Dude, yes." We're like, dude, your head is going to fucking explode, Todd. This your place, head, Todd. Your head is going to explode. Yeah. yeah, you are going to, this place is going to drive you bananas. And then we got a phone call from him yeah. from that club when he was doing the show there. <laughs> oh, shit. No, and do you remember that, like, the owner, the, the, the policy was you, you would sit back in the manager's office and you could order an entree and the, the opener could only have an appetizer. Oh, right. God. But, what? but we got a butt dial. We got a butt dial from Todd, and it yeah. was him ordering food, but his phone was in his pocket, and it was a total accident. And he was like, he was haggling, he, he was trying to get more food for the opener, I think. And oh, like, that's yeah. the sweetest! <laughs> such yeah. a sweetheart. I love him. He's such a genuinely sweet man. He would, yeah. he would fight for the opener, and it's like, because yeah. I'm sure he was like, "What is it? An extra like four dollars? You're gonna yeah. pay?" No, just like fucking let the kid eat. What are you doing? Got to eat chicken nuggets. Give him a piece of fish. Who cares? <laughs> yeah, I mean, come on. That's that's really that's a but. If, if you had sent him that voicemail, he probably would have played it on his podcast. <laughs> I haven't seen Todd Glass in a long time. I miss Todd Glass. Yeah, we used to. I felt bad because Todd Glass went on a big viral campaign, uh, Twitter campaign, to get himself a role in Super Troopers too. And uh, <laughs> I think it was the kind of thing where he thought if he did it enough, it was going to work. But we have, we're the only ones who knew him. And we had, I remember, I remember uh, one of the guys was like, do you know who this guy Todd Glass is? We're like, yeah, he's a great guy. We've been on his podcast a few times, a super great guy. Like, what is this thing he's doing here? <laughs> and, <we're, laughs> and it was a thing. And ultimately, we couldn't, uh, we couldn't push him through. <laughs> Next season at Tacoma FD. Yeah. Todd Glass. Todd Glass. That's right. That'd be good. Glass. That'd be good. Yeah, uh, my my only well, my my, my kind of weirdest experiences with comedy were always um, college shows. Oh yeah, but I and only because you know, like going through the NACA conventions is such a surreal experience where you're performing yeah. for college bookers and everyone's kind of hawking their wares. You know, it's like magicians and comedy and and musicians. You know, and it yeah. and it really is all designed to make you feel like oh, I'm not special at all. You know, like which is good. It's like that kind oh. of dampening of the ego is good to remind you like we're all in this thing together. Yeah, you want to get depressed? Go to a NACA convention. Trust but, me. But but I but I really <laughs> I had the experience. I had I got to have the experience with my my best friend Mike Furman because we were touring together and doing a musical act, and it was great. But we would literally show up at a college and they you know they go okay so. Um, you know, we just started handing out flyers for the show this afternoon, and we're like, this afternoon? <laughs> we had so many shows where we would just perform for the staff who was there. Like, you know, it was in a dorm, so it was the security staff there. And I remember at the time, it just felt like, ugh. But I look back at some of the most fun times that I got to share with my best friend and these, like, really fun comedy war stories where we – Oh God! Remember that one show where they put us at the top of a stairwell, and there, like, there was an open rotunda, and people were trying to study. I mean, those are those are the real character builders, and those are the ones. Oh you man, never Absolutely. you don't you don't recount the stories where everything went off perfectly. You kind of you know, kind of forget. No, them. we uh, those are our best stories. You know, like, and, and those college ones are tough too because what people don't realize is that the the university pays you, right? So it's not like the kids are buying tickets. So they're not they're not they don't have any stake in the game. They don't they give can take you or right? leave you. Yeah, they could, mm-hmm. they don't care. And so we did a show, uh, we did a sketch show uh, at Hobart College, and they booked us for freshman orientation. So they yeah. got all the freshmen into this arena, and then they said, Ed Harris, broken lizard, whatever. And so then we went out, and we did our comedy show, and people immediately started going out because they wanted to party, and they left or whatever. And everything continued to proceed to fall apart. You know, we, we, we realized that the lights were fucked up. Uh, we were getting changed in our costumes and there was a hole in the curtain. And every time someone changed, you could see the audience could see their ass and they were laughing. It was just a terrible, terrible thing. And we videotaped it. And the most fun we ever had, we went back to our hotel room afterwards and we watched the videotape 
of how horrible that show was. And it was a it was a bonding moment. It was the funniest thing, and it was the worst show we ever did. Yeah. Those are the ones, yeah, those are the ones that are for you and the and and again, it's it's the character builders. But but it it, it does sort of highlight the idea that the um the some of the best things in life are the flaws and not the seamless perfection moments and why why we get so obsessed with striving for like a, a an idea an ideal a perfection ideal that not only doesn't really exist but it but it's also just like weirdly not, not as, as fun, fun. <laughs> yeah you right you don't grow you know it's sort of like, hey, taking it back to the gym, you guys. You know, your old jock buddy, Chris Hardwick. But it's you know, like, those days where you feel great and everything's easy, like, those are fine. You don't really remember those. You don't really grow from them. You grow from the days where you dragged yourself in. You felt like ass. You did it anyway. You know, there's some Muhammad Ali quote about, like, he would do sit-ups until he would get tired, and then he would start counting because right. – those were the ones where like the growth happened. And so why are we so failure averse in, you know, culturally when the mistakes and the flaws and the imperfections are like, that's where the, the meat really is. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, absolutely. You know, it's, uh, I always say that like people who grew up rich are way less interesting than people who grew up poor. Because the people who grew up poor have a lot of perspective on things and have a lot of, lot of really nutty stories that they can tell, you know. And it's it's. I don't know if that's a fair metaphor, but I think it's it's accurate in that like, it's those hardships. It's the it's, those are the things that really make you, you know. And if everything is just easy for you, it's not you know your stories will be like okay, or and your you know your your growth pattern will be okay. But when you have like real challenges and real obstacles, whether it's in life or just stand up comedy, uh, you know, those are good. Those are good, exciting character builders. And so are you do you kind of feel at this point in your lives, at this point in your careers, do you feel comfortable, content or do you still feel that fire of like, no, there's still so much more to do. And there's so much more to do in a business where no one knows what the fuck's going on anymore. <laughs> I don't know. You know, we worked a lot, a lot of years to try to get a TV show. I mean, to be honest with you, it's like, uh, you know, we had decent success at the movie stuff, but we had sold scripts for 10 years trying to get pilots made and just couldn't get over that hump. And then finally we did with this one. So I'm, I'm feeling pretty content. I might retire now. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> okay, I'm done. <laughs> See, I'm feeling, I'm feeling the opposite. Like I, I feel like, and I don't know, I can't tell if Kevin's joking or not. Cause you know, I, I don't, I don't understand his sense of humor still after 30 years. <laughs> I, uh, you know, it's like, this is, I think the highest we've ever been in our careers, you know, uh, it's two successful seasons, potentially a third season coming. And we've got two movies in development. One of them is super troopers three. We're going to make those movies. And, and that's never been, you know the case with us before it's always been like either four or five years between movies or trying to get a tv show made and now actually we're here where we really want to be and now to me that one of my friends is like if you get a season three when would you start i'd say we, we'd start pretty soon with the writing process and he said are you going to take a break and i was like i would like to take a break but actually this is the time when i should try to set more stuff up you know like Let's do an animation. Count your set. sit ups, man. This is when you start counting your sit ups. <laughs> That's right. That's exactly right. Hi guys. Huh? He brought it around. He brought it around. <laughs> well, it's just, it's tough because in this business, I, I have this kind of general, and this is not a hard and fast rule, but as a general guideline, I think the germination period from seed to fruition is about 18 months. You know, that's a, in television, about 18 months, you start working on something, you pitch something. It can take about 18 months before it gets on the air. And that's a that's not a that's a pretty good in movies, it could be like, you know, 36 months, you know. Right, right. Yeah. And so yeah, I mean, I understand that you're looking ahead to like a year and a half from now. Okay, well, if we want to do pitch an animated show, we really need to figure it out now because that's not something that would come out before like 2022 or 2023. So you're just planting seeds, but then what do you think the balance is between responsibly planting seeds, but then also not stressing too much about the future. What is the difference between 
the preparation and doing it on the day. Huh? Take it back. Take it back. The Heffernan yeah. versus Lemmy uh, approach. <laughs> True. I no, I mean, I don't know. I, we, we've learned you have to throw as much shit at the wall as you can, I think. So it's like, I think you don't, you, you can't even worry about if you, if you, you're oversaturated because you've never, it's hard to get to that point. You know, I, I think what we learned is that uh, in this business, there are just windows of momentum and you can be in a window of momentum and, and you accomplish it and then you go cold and then you can't get things done. So when you're in that window of momentum, throw as much shit at the wall as you can and just see what happens, you know? Exactly. I agree. It is a business of momentum. It's, I don't think it's ever really about one job. I think it's the sum total of everything and it's creating the momentum that sort of helps you through the cold periods or the lean times, or at least limits the effect of, you know, and the business is in a cold period right now. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone's scrambling to try to figure out how do we shoot things? When can we get stuff? You know, we don't have stuff. We need stuff. Um, And so it is like that momentum is very helpful in sort of creating opportunity and giving you a little bit of protection from, you know, and you gotta be ready in that, in that window, you gotta have things to do. Yeah. Well, it's, it's also, I think it's challenging too, because it's like, even for yourself, like I remember, you know, uh, like my wife isn't in the, in, in the industry. And it was, I think explaining sometimes that like, you know, I'm working on something free for free. Like nobody's, <laughs> I'm working on it. I'm writing this thing and it could be 10 years from now that I go out with this thing, or it could be two years from now that I go out with this thing or whatever it is. It's like, you do a lot of free work in preparation. And also it's like when you sell something, even there are times Kevin and I have waited, you know, we've sold things and waited 18 months for a negotiation, you know, or, or you sign a deal and you wait for nine months to get paid. Yep. And so it's like the lesson I've learned is you have to have as much going as you possibly can. I really, as I get older, I'm, I'm really becoming, I think more and more of a like, I don't know, it'll probably be okay. You know, like, <laughs> rather than, the, oh, I need to, I need to lay all these, these, these pitch eggs, you know, and like <laughs> most of them aren't going to make it, but maybe one or two, you know. Right. And, and, and I just think like, boy, what a stressful way to live. You're just always like engaged and who fucking has energy for that anymore? I just, and you have kids, sure. right, Kevin? Yeah, I got kids. Let me get kids. I got three, three kids and teenagers. So, you know, I mean, that's teenagers. energy, you know, like, especially now in a quarantine, that, like it was, yeah, well, you, I mean, know, I, you know, yeah, go ahead. well, I was going to say it was, it was, it was the other way around for me. It's like when my first kid was born. He's eight now. When my first kid was born, I was holding him in the in the the room, you know, the, on his first day of of in my hands, and I was looking at him. I was like, "That's it. I'm done fucking around. Like now, I'm gonna go full steam because I gotta I gotta support this kid. You know, I gotta give this kid the best life I can possibly do." And that inspired me to work harder. Now, listen, those motherfuckers don't respect what I'm doing. They unless we chain them to the wall, they would be in here right now screaming. I'd have to be on mute. They don't appreciate it. But uh, those they, kids, are you telling me those kids don't appreciate your the uh, volumes of masturbation jokes in casinos? I know what the hell, man. By, by the way, I just I envision you holding a baby and then just shouting out in the hospital like, "I'm not fucking around anymore." <laughs> <laughs> They're like, "What's going on?" No, no, I'm doing this for my kid. I'm not. You hear me? I'm not fucking around anymore. <laughs> I don't know. I, I do think that um, kids really change the equation and they can, I feel like they could change the equation on either side where you could go, Oh, all these things that I stress about career stuff, you know, that's not as important fostering this life or the other side of like, I really need to get into gear because I need to protect this child and make sure that they have everything that they need. I mean, I guess it just, I don't know. I guess it just sort of depends on where you're at when the, when the kid is born. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Ke- yeah, Kevin's kids are older. And certainly this p- period of time, like I-, I think about the way our TV show af- af- affects us, you know, like, uh, like our TV show, we've been working pretty hard nonstop for the last two, two and a half years now on this thing. You know, and it's like, I, I wonder, you know, if your kids are older. And so they're, yeah, you know, a, a little more self sufficient. They were shocked though. I mean, we, we had spent so much time working on the show that, you know, when, when the pandemic started and I was home for dinner at night, they're like, what's going on here? What's this? Are you and mom splitting up? What is this? I know. Right. And so, and then, you know, you get into the situation where 
you're home all the time and you are the one providing entertainment, you know? And it's a blast, but you know, it's a whole different dynamic for them, you know? They're like- Let me ask a bit of advice. As you know, I feel like in the not too distant future, you know, my wife and I will start trying to see if, you know, if maybe we can start a family. And, but I, but comedy is really specific because when you, it takes a lot of focus. And when you sort of hit a vein of comedy, you can't be distracted because then you'll forget it or lose it. And that's like precious ore. And sure. so how do you be a good parent? Because sometimes, because your kids don't know or care that you, they don't understand that you might have like hit a comedy vein and you really need to focus on it when they need right. you, they need you. So how do you, how do you, you lock the fucking door? You lock the fucking door you lock and keep them out of the room. <laughs> that's what you do. Kevin built Kevin built a wall and a door. I had doors put in with locks on them so that I could do that. But that's, you know, that's the easy one. I mean, but I think also it's just a matter of you're, it, it, what happens is, and Lemmy found this too, is because, you know, and I found this, is that you're, you know, you just mine different things for comedy and then it all, it all feeds into each other, right? So it's like, I was like, I'm never going to do jokes about my kids. You know what I mean? And then you, that's a whole area of comedy and you start doing them and, you know, I think you just find different things in your life. Obviously, you have to draw on your life, and and so you do that. So that you just fold it in, you know. But yeah, I mean, otherwise, I just lock the little punks out. You know? They're trying to get in here right now, you know. <laughs> Don't they know you're doing a pod? Daddy's doing a podcast. What a sad sentence. Well, no, it was it was funny because she walked in a minute before I got on, and she was like, uh, "Dad, I'm doing a uh, paper for my summer school class about decolonization and nationalism, and I'd like to talk to you." And I was like, ah, "Hold on a second. <laughs> I gotta go do Hardwood's podcast. Here. Come on. We'll talk by the way, later. By the way, having witnessed a million of these uh, interruptions, Kev, I, I must say that that's the most respectful one I've ever heard of. Because a lot of the time, like Kevin and I are working. First of all, I'm Uncle Steve. They don't give a shit if I'm on the other end of the yeah. Zoom. But we'll be on a business thing. We'll be on a business call with somebody, and they come in. They're like, "Dad," and he's like. <laughs> Out, out, out. And they're like, no, no. And he's like, get out of here. And then like the son, the son, the 12 year old son would be like, you can't make me leave. And it's like, then the, the, the mute and he storms off. And, like, a bitch. Yeah. <laughs> and then they would be, you know, they would be a silhouette in your window back there, Chris. You know, they'd be sitting in that yeah, window. You know what you have there. to do? You have to, you have to fold that into the pitch like Darren Stevens style from Bewitch. I'm glad you appreciated our little demonstration here. What we want to do is to add a comedy dynamic of a son who doesn't give a shit about anything his father said. You have to. Yes, brilliant, brilliant. Yeah. Great job, but, Darren. You've done it again. <laughs> it is true, by the way. It's like when he finally gets the kids out, like the reason his, his blinds are, are, are closed back there is because <laughs> then they'll come around and they'll be back there at the window doing the thing. You're like, like a local news report? Like a person? Yeah. Waving yeah. yeah. The background I'm on, a, I'm on a network call here, guys. <laughs> come on. Yeah. That's pandemic living, though. It happens to everybody. You'll, you'll be on a conference call with a network and you know, the, some kid will walk into the, you know, the president of the network. Well, the, the kid will walk in and, you know, you know, it's just the way it works now. Yeah, did you, did you clog the toilet? No, oh, please don't. <laughs> I'm trying to. Come on, cut a deal here. I had, Kevin knows this one. I had another one. I was on with my agent and he was literally, he was in his bedroom and uh, we were on, on a Zoom call. And I think he, he got confused and thought he was using his iPad and he, on his computer screen, he hit the mute button. And obviously nothing happened. And his wife fucking laid into him and just started giving it to him. And he's like, well, I'm on a Zoom call. And, and, and she's just yelling at him, yelling at me. And, <laughs> and, and he holds up his finger and like walks off screen. I can hear them arguing. We're like, oh my God. And then he comes back and he's like, <laughs> really? Did you guys? And we're like, yes. <laughs> and he's like, I'm really sorry. You know, for, people, like, for people listening to the podcast, it was the space work of poking just under like, <laughs> the bottom, thinking that he was poking mute. And it's like, oh, no, you're on a laptop. Those aren't, that doesn't have <laughs> doesn't a capacity work. touch screen on yeah. it. That's, you just poked your laptop. We got, <laughs> got all that. We got all that. Oh, yeah, my God. Yeah, it is. But that's that's part of the... This is part of the relearning and growth process of what it means to effectively have your home be your workspace. And for a lot of comedians, artists, you know, a, a lot of us really did work at home anyway, but I don't, I think I underestimated like how much I actually did go to other places 
either to a cafe to write or to a little studio to podcast or whatever. It's like, oh yeah, now how, how do we like delineate home work? Like how do we create that balance? When we've just been shoved into our homes. Yeah. And it's going to be different too, because it, we, we experienced it in the editing of this TV show. You know, when we shut down to edit the show, everyone went remote. So we shut down the editing room and everyone went remotely and, and everyone explored this new software that it allows you to edit, you know, in a shared space and whatever it is. And I, I think by, when we come back, all that shit's going to be changed because, you know, people are now figuring out how they really can do their work at their home. And I think, you know, it's not going to come all the way back the way it was. I think people are going to embrace that a little bit more. Yeah, right? I think it's, I think it's especially in the beginning when it's really allowed again, there's definitely going to be an initial agoraphobia. There's definitely going to be a lot of like, please don't stand so close. Even if things are fine, I think people will still have, yeah, we'll still have some collective spatial issues. But, but Zoom will still exist, and the shared absolutely. editing software that they created will still exist, and people well, are going to use it. Especially for companies who are always looking to cut bottom line and then go, oh, we don't need an office building. We'll just ever, sure. you know, we'll save one hundred twenty thousand dollars a year on. Yeah, and I don't have to fly to New York for that meeting, you know, or whatever it is. You know what I mean? There's gonna be a lot yeah. of that. So yeah, and it'll and it it will just become like some things will be. I almost feel like it, it it'll become like a premium experience. Oh, this person wants to meet in person. Oh wow, you know. I don't need to go to Hardwick Studio to do his podcast. You know, I, don't I, mean, I don't need this really great little podcast studio. And it's just like, <laughs> it, I don't know what you guys are talking about. I want to get the fuck out of here. <laughs> I, think your can hear you. I think your family can probably hear you <laughs> you want to get out of your house let me are you you're trapped in your house is that what comes out there i gotta go <laughs> steve's no, just holding I, up signs save when me. was the last time you've been in a restaurant i haven't been in a restaurant have you gone out for a restaurant or anything like that chris i haven't no. been in a restaurant in a while no 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 we don't we wouldn't even yeah i'm not my wife, my wife has a, a little bit of a kidney thing, and it puts her. Yeah. In, she has a high. She's in, she's in a high risk category, and so we just, you know, anytime we've ever even gotten takeout, it's from one of two places, and the one place comes out and puts it in your. You, know, you pop the you, you pop the trunk. They put it. Yeah, in, they put it in your. Yeah, you know, yeah. they have our credit card on file, and the other place. I've only been to a couple times is a pizza place where it's like only it, it's kind of a takeout place anyway. Yeah, One person in at a time. There's a plexiglass shield in between you and the cashier. I have fucking gloves, double masks <laughs> on, over my eyes. Me too. My eyes don't get any too. goo or yeah. whatever. Yeah, yeah. And you know, I like I I open with the gloves. I get back in the car, remove the gloves. I sanitize my hand. You know, it's like there's a whole there's a whole like you know decontamination process. And absolutely. But but even that's been very minuscule. So. Even the idea, like we drive by, I see people like even eating outside, even with barriers in between the other tables. I just see people chatting like everything's normal. I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, like, I, and I'm sure it's fine. I, I, I don't know, but it just sure. makes me wildly uncomfortable. And it feels like not worth the risk for me, you know, like. Sure, I'm in your camp. Absolutely. You so know? is Lemmy. Yeah. Yeah. Just better be, let's just do our part <laughs> and get this thing moving in the right direction and also not get ourselves sick get somebody else sick let's do it yeah. this is our this is our challenge right now for me I, I really don't i mean i say this you know having had the benefit of not having had it but i'm not i'm just not as concerned about me i'm concerned about like what if i got it and i didn't i was asymptomatic asymptomatic I gave yeah. it to lydia i gave it to my mom you know yeah mm-hmm who's also in a higher risk group, you know, because she's, you know, she's my mom and she's yeah. in the age range. And, um, and so it just isn't, to me, it's just not worth it to like risk people and even people that I don't know, I would never, sure. you know? I mean, yeah, like, well, and if, also- they, if, if they could do a thing where they could track, like if you had it and you were being irresponsible, everyone you gave it to, it would mm-hmm. be horrifying, you know? And they so- should be able to track that. We should be able to do that by now, but yes, you're right. Yeah, and so I just feel like I would rather not risk it because I just would not, I just couldn't handle it if I if I had Absolutely. it. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. But it, it has it has this process helped focus your writing anymore, or has it made it more difficult, or is it about the same? Well, I, I think mean, it's been, been more focused. I think it really has. I mean, you know, there's there certainly are less distractions in the terms of 
having to go places and do things and whatever it is, you know, um, you know, yeah. I don't know. It's Let been me... harder. It's been a harder post process for sure. We we've been in post production this whole time. It's definitely stretched it out. Uh, you know, we got the from a technical school. perspective. Though. I mean, technical from a technical perspective, it's more challenging to get yeah. things accomplished to do yeah. sound mixes and you know things like that remotely is a difficult thing. Yeah, I love being at home, and I love you know whether it's stand up comedy or editing or anything, any writing I do, I always have bouts of procrastination. I'll do like 30 minutes on and then I'll take a few minutes off. And whereas it used to be, you know, playing a video game or something like that, now I got my kids here. And so I'll get up and I'll go kiss them and I'll roll around with them and I'll be like, all right, I'm going back. I, I'll get sick of them. And then I'll come back <laughs> and, and come back to work. Uh, so that's, that's great. And, you know, it is also nice. Like now, once now we're we're basically wrapping this up. I'm gonna I'm gonna get into some hardcore writing and also reading. I want to read some books. Ooh, let me. Oh, there you go. All I right. want to read some books. <laughs> I have a stack. I have a stack here. No, I have a stack here. I've got uh, some books here that I want to read. I want to read uh, John Irving, A Widow for a Year. Beauty is okay. funny. Yeah, I know. Wow. Let me uh, tell you what, you're not going to have time, buddy. We're going to start writing a new season. Right. No, 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 I'm reading books. I'm reading books. <laughs> the Sunshine When She's Gone by Thea Goodman. This is uh, my, uh, Kevin, Thea Goodman wrote a book. Oh, great, okay. Remember Thea Goodman? Yeah. You don't care. He doesn't care. Doesn't matter. This is an audio podcast, Lemmy. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate the show and tell. <laughs> Chris, I, I appreciate your appreciation of my show and tell. Yeah, I mean, you I'm know, just, it's like... It, <laughs> I just gotta remind Lemmy where he is. That's all. Sometimes Chris. have you? Have it's you, necessary. So you're gonna read. So you're gonna read books, Kevin. Have you picked up anything, Kev? About a, 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 have you picked up a new hobby? Any kind of extra thing? Have you? Have you thought? Oh, I have a little bit of extra time, so I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna play games, or I'm gonna learn a skill, or I'm gonna learn a language. Like, have you? Have you? It's funny, not yet, because like we, you know, like when we started this, we we still owed ten episodes, and that's what we've been doing, and everyone's been getting so bored. And I'm like, God, I just wish I, I'd like to get bored, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, and people are firing through all their shows, and they're, you know, yeah, learning languages. And you know, my wife is doing like, you know, Orange Theory workouts in the garage. And I'm like, we're just editing, and now we're done. And I'm kind of like, oh shit, now now I can get bored. Now I can do some stuff. So I'm looking Not forward me, Kev. to it. Not me, Kev. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll bring you some ideas, buddy. We're gonna <laughs> Thanks, we're gonna man. crush this thing. We're gonna knock this Thank one you. out of the park. Thank you. When will you, you find out? Um, is Tacoma FD on? It doesn't start till August. Or well, it started uh, this past Thursday with episode seven. So like we'd cut off in the yeah. middle of the season. Well, we have yeah, we aired the first six in the spring, and then they shut us down because we didn't. We we had this to shut down in order to finish the edit, so they paused us. Yeah, and then they relaunched us. So you're in the so middle. You're in the middle. That that wasn't. So they called it a mid-season premiere. And yeah. so now we've just started that up again. Very now. clever pivot. Very clever yes. pivot. Yes. Right. And so uh, we'll go into into September. We'll we'll air into September. And yeah. any any thoughts about? Are you already thinking about season three, or do you just like not worry about that until they say do a season three? No. We're, no. Yeah, we're, we definitely are. I mean, they're, they're <clears throat> it's kind of being danced around. You know, I think everyone's trying to figure out. It feels like it's going to happen, but they're trying to figure out when do people go into production and how they do production, how they shoot things again. And I think that's the hurdle right now. But we've had kind of preliminary talks about starting the writer's room again and getting up and running. And so uh, I think, you know, the uh, hiatus will be short-lived and we'll probably, you know, probably in a couple of weeks, we would probably start writing new episodes. Oh, wow. That's incredible. Well, I yeah. do hope that you get some time to get bored, Kevin. Yeah. Um, yes, it's. I'm going on a Winnebago trip for a week. Are you? You're gonna do it? Yeah. Gonna do it? Yeah. Well, it's self-contained, right? You got your own toilet. You got your own thing. So I throw the kids in the Winnebago, and then we're gonna go drive to Wyoming. That's. I fantastic. think it sounds awesome. <laughs> I want to do it. I want to do something like that. I think we're we're talking about doing something like that. Yeah. I have a lot of friends who've done the RV trip. You know, like they just. Yeah. And uh, and one friend, <clears throat> his kids are like eight and ten, I think. And he goes, yeah, we're going to throw their bikes on the back of the thing. And I go, so when you go to campgrounds, are you worried that your kids are just going to go play with a bunch of other kids? <laughs> and, and he goes, well, you know, they're, they're, they're very aware. Like, they're very aware of what's safe and not safe. And it's like, yeah, but you don't know. You don't know. <laughs> they might be telling you, you, oh, yeah, it's fine. And then, you know, 
they're, sure. they're basically, uh, I don't know. You just, yeah. you just don't know. You just don't know what, what the kids are going to run off and do. Here's what I'll tell you, Chris, since you were asking for uh, child advice. Kids are filthy fucking creatures. That's what you <laughs> They put their fingers in things and then put their fingers in their mouths. That's and what they, they do. And then they touch your face. And uh, then they, yeah. yes. they, they cough in your face. They sneeze in your face. They, no they boundaries. There drugs. are no boundaries. Carry, yeah. Yeah, I, I think I, I do. I mean, even before this, all my friends who are parents are like, yeah, you know, those first handful of years, you just get everything because they bring it home from school. You know, like that's because that's their bodies like are – are building up defenses to things and so they kind of get everything and then they and then they give it to you <laughs> so i have friends who just for like years just got colds all the time sure. you know? it makes you sound unappealing doesn't it chris <laughs> it sounds unappealing doesn't it I, you know, kevin had three kids i kevin i feel like you were sick for about eight straight years oh yeah there's always somebody who's sick that's the thing yeah well that's the thing about the schools being shut down now that i've been sick and i haven't sick in a long time you know Kids aren't bringing shit back. I guess that's the, the same grace. Yeah. yeah, but now you got to be a high school geometry teacher. That's so. the other, that's the problem, is that now I got to talk about decolonization. <laughs> <laughs> you have to be about everything. But at least we have the internet now, you know? I know it. I know it. You know, even I can like, find any answer. God, even in the 80s, if someone didn't know something, it was like, I don't know, go to the library. Well, library's closed. Well, I guess you're just not going to know that thing. You're screwed. Because, yeah. I yeah. and my immediate circle of friends do not know the answer to that. And so you are probably not going to know the answer to that. <laughs> yeah, like, and, and you fix that thing. I just do it on the internet. It's fine. I feel like when we were in our 20s, like our producer, Rich Perillo, had like a Nexus account. Do you remember that? Yeah. And like Nexus, every Lexus. Then, yep. Mm. If, if you really had something pressing, you'd be like, all right, you can fucking use it. Sure, why not? And then you'd go and you'd. <laughs> You type in your thing. Is it? Uh, sure. You know, is it's it, like nineteen ninety four. Yeah. Yeah. Is the title of the movie "If You Could See What I Feel" or "If You Could Feel What I See"? What is that? <laughs> Look it up. Okay. Got it. You may never have known that before. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You may never have known that before. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There was a there was a song that for twenty years I did not know the name of, and I heard it in a restaurant bar in new york in like 2000 and it always bothered me that i this is obviously pre shazam never knew what it was i only knew like two words from the song and every so often when you know as the internet became more expansive i would google and try to check never found out and like a month ago i googled it and i fucking found out what the song was <laughs> and 20 years ago and I thought, what a magical time. There was a time in history when I would have never, unless I just accidentally, and it was just this weird French disco pop song, but in Spanish, but it was a okay. French <laughs> disco pop song. Never in a million years you'd find it. find it. They kept referring to Don Quixote in the song. <laughs> and I kept typing song, disco, Don Quixote. But what I didn't know is because they were French, they spelled it Don Quixote. So they ah. spelled it differently. It was like C H O T T E, and that's where I got fucked. <laughs> and that moment of like getting to tie that loop off and putting the light bulb. That in bed was yeah. so satisfying. Yeah, and then <laughs> then you put it on your playlist, on your summer playlist. And after one playing, you're like, I wish that song wasn't on my fucking playlist. <laughs> this is what I searched for for 20 yeah. years. I'm over it. <laughs> so we had, you know, we had an interesting thing last last season in the writer's room where it was like, I found it infuriating because like that, if you could see what I feel, if you could hear what I see thing was a conversation that Kevin and I had. It was a debate that we had back in like 92. Yeah. in a room full of friends late at night with the bet being the loser has to do 10 minutes of stand-up comedy. None of us had done the stand-up comedy. And we had no way of figuring out what the title was. And so we were just reasoning with each other as to why it must be this way. And it was like an hour and a half. And then we realized we had one of those like Leonard Malton movie guides or something like that. We're like, aha. And we, and we solved the bet. Kevin got it right. I lost the bet. But those Discuss those conversations to me were so fantastic and the basis of, of so many evenings, you know, where you can't figure something out and like you don't know the answer to something, you're asking strangers, they don't know, blah, 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 all this shit. 
<laughs> and we had, you know, in our writer's room last, last season, there was some discussion hanging on and we have some, you know, some younger folks in there. And before we could even start sinking our teeth into the meat of what this great thing was going to be, they all had it on their thing. They're like, it's this. And they would give you the answer and you're like, oh, like that's not yeah. satisfying at all. No, I, I know the experience. I mean, it's almost like, first of all, you should almost never have a question about anything trivia related because you have the sum total of human knowledge in your pocket. Yeah. And I feel like asking other people questions is the new vinyl where it's, it's like, <laughs> yeah, there's just like a really rich experience. You can, you know, you sure. really feel what they were recording, you know, that it, it's like, that's the old person thing now of asking other people yeah. questions. Or like rolling down the window and ask someone directions. <laughs> right. Let that dad anymore. do this. It's kind of an old timey yeah. thing. Excuse yeah. me, how do I get to park? <laughs> how do I get there? You know. <laughs> Well, that but then you know where they're going. I know it's just part of the experience. We're gonna go to we're gonna go to five of the wrong streets, and then. It, but it's the journey, you know. Like the journey is the part, not the goal. The journey is the is is where the meat is. Which goes back to what we were talking about. It's yep. those early days, those shitty times. You know, you need those experiences. You know. Take it back around. <laughs> Full circle, baby. No, well, that, listen, we're smarter. We're smarter because you know, as this girl explained. When you just have the answer like that, you wind up not retaining that information. You got the answer, she said it, and then that information will be forgotten. <laughs> when you work it out and you earn it, you learn it. Well, our brains basically go. have external hard drives where we don't, you know, it's like we used to take up a lot of space in our brains with phone numbers and remembering movie lines and remembering people. And now we have these external hard drives and we've left a lot of room in our brain, extra room for things like anxiety and depression and <laughs> negative self-talk. <laughs> I think of it as room for joy, Chris. Come on. Oh, 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 yeah, 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 have you have you had social distanced hangouts yet with people? Not, um, I have a little bubble with my brother and his wife. That's it. That's all yeah. I have. We, Lemmy we and have... I have seen each other twice for work purposes, uh, for sound mixes, and we you know wear masks and we stand the other side of the room from each other. So. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And the elbow. Yeah. We had the we had the um, well we had family here for a few weeks, and then we had uh, I think the first. We had a couple over, our first group over here, and it's, and it's awkward. Like, the first few moments are awkward because you're like, do we hug or do we not? You don't really know how to say hi to people from six feet away or used to hugging people or shaking hands or something like that. Yeah, don't, 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 hug, don't shake hands. Just wave. Don't do it, man. Just say hi. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, what's up? Hi hey, and bye. Come on in. Hey. Yeah. Hey. It's not worth it. Yeah. Don't do it. Just, just walk. wave from a distance. It's okay. Yeah. Stay away from a distance. Yeah. Not a big deal. Someday we'll get back in the studio again. We'll cut, we'll go back in the Chris studio and you know, we'll all get back in the home. It will be a tramp of return into that studio. Yes. Which of course, you know, I will have to um clear out of the cobwebs and ghosts that are yeah. that, that have squatted <laughs> there and are taking up residence. But, Rodents uh, and whatnot. I look forward to that day. I really look forward to seeing you all first again. <laughs> I feel like this is like Me too. the fourth time you've been on the podcast. I think so. I think so. Uh, third, uh, third or fourth? Yeah. 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 Yep. Through the years, you know, the years. And a half a yeah. podcast. I, I feel like yeah. it's like the fourth time you've been on. So yeah, yeah. hopefully the so. fifth time, that'll be the triumphant in-studio return. That'll be the end of the coronavirus. Yeah, yeah uh, we've been all over. We, you know, we, we did your, your studio, we did your house, now we're doing a Zoom. Yeah, you did at midnight. <laughs> like, you've done... Yep. We did at midnight, yeah. yep. Yeah, yeah, we've gotten to do a lot of fun stuff. Yeah, I, I won, by the way. I won at midnight. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't know why it's about winning and results. Steve, it's yeah, really come on. It's about fun. Yeah, what are Which, you clearly, the scoring system indicated that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the scoring system was very arbitrary. But it's fine. Yeah. Like, take the win. Take, yeah. take the win. You got it. it. But uh, good luck with the rest of the, the season two. And I hope Thanks, that you man. guys, uh, I hope you get a season three and, and uh, just... Hang in there. Stay safe and healthy, man. Thank, Thank you, man. man. Appreciate, it. Appreciate it. Same to you. Take care. Good talking, okay, buddy. Bye. To the end. <laughs> <laughs>
ID10T scanning complete. Enjoy your burrito.